Stephen King truly needs no introduction. He has authored so many books by now and has earned the moniker of being the king of horror. I had the privilege to read 13 of his books so far and before I come out with a video where I read four more of his books, I decided that I should probably review the ones that I have already read. And so today I'll be posing myself a challenge. Can I review the 13 books that I've read by Stephen King in one minute? And I'll be going in chronological order. Carrie. I mean, this book is so iconic, so it truly needs no introduction. Uh, it's been adapted so many times, and I honestly couldn't believe that this was Stephen King's first outing as an author because you're just not allowed to be that good on your first go around. Um, for me, the characters were definitely the standouts. I loved Carrie, I loved um, Sue Snell, and I loved the mother. Well, maybe loved is using the wrong word, but I found it very interesting how she misinterprets the Bible and then almost creates like her own stream of Christianity that she like imposes on her daughter um yeah so ideologically i found that to be very interesting um oh my gosh i'm running out of time ah. oh my gosh yes and the epistolary uh, aspects of the book were really interesting so i really enjoyed that yeah okay i feel like i had more time than i thought i did so i'm going to try to remember that going forward Salem's Lot. Some people say that Salem's Lot is one of Stephen King's best books, but I ardently disagree. Um, of course, it was the first book that I read that actually had scary vampires because when I was younger, I read a lot of romanticy and paranormal, paranormal romances and monsters feature quite heavily in those, especially after Twilight. So I was never really exposed to vampires being scary. Um, and so I found that aspect to be very interesting and especially <laughs> that they're scary but in the sense of like they're also business owners which i thought was so funny um that being said i really found this book to be really boring don't get me wrong the start is very iconic as well as the ending um where you're introduced to these two characters and you're told that one is an older man one is a younger man but they aren't related and they're traveling around they, you don't know why they're traveling asking weird questions very interesting very intriguing most of the book boring okay i feel like that was better <laughs> the shining Monsters are real, ghosts are too. They live inside of us and sometimes they win. It's such a banger quote and I think really showcases what I think the strength of this book is. And that strength is the fact that it deals with alcoholism and it shows that that is truly the, big, the biggest demon, the biggest monster um, and not the big scary hotel. Uh, Jack and his struggle with it and how it destroys Jack's family was Oh, so heartbreaking and especially when we take into account this one final scene that I won't spoil don't worry but it's between Jack and Danny and I think it involves a staircase and a fire hydrant if I remember correctly I might not um, but that one scene at the end is one of the best things I've ever read I did expect this to be more scary based on the movie but there were a lot of differences and I think I prefer the mo the book the book to the movie sorry and uh oh and this also starts the trend of King using like racist language to show evil characters and that was really uncomfortable. So it did bog the book down for me. Yes, I know it's a product of its time, but I'm reading it now, so rage. The infamous book that is out of print at Stephen King's request because it was found in the possession of a few school shooters. Not ideal, but so what it is what is it actually about it's about this guy called charlie decker who decides to shoot up his high school and there's this weird vibe as if he's right for doing that and so i don't know how to feel about that um and other than charlie the other characters that we we're spending time with because we do spend a lot of time with the side characters and exploring their relationships and stuff i didn't really find them to be that interesting so to be honest, all in all, I was mostly bored the entire time and yeah, it just gives off really weird vibes. So if you can't read this one, I I don't know, I really don't think you're missing that much. The Stand. Now this one, if you don't read this one, you are missing out on a lot. I love The Stand. I read it during 2020, so truly the optimal time um, and man. There is this one chapter where you follow the virus as it spreads from person to person as if it's like almost a character. 
that was one of the best things I've ever read in my life. Um, the characters are such standouts. Of course, you have Sue, uh, Franny, but for me, I loved Harold <laughs> and Trash Can Man. Okay, I know those are like the two randomest people that to get like so invested in, but they deserved better, okay? <laughs> and I feel so bad for them. Um, and yeah, it's uh, it's such a great journey. So I really, really recommend that you do read it. I was also excited to see more of it a couple times in the other books, and this was his first big outing. Loved this, loved this book. The Long Walk. Any game looks straight if everyone is being cheated at once. It's truly the thesis statement, I think, for this book. And we follow uh, Garrity in this um, dystopian world where there's this competition called The Long Walk, where 100 boys are chosen to walk for as long as they can, and the last one left standing uh, wins. Except if you fall too far behind or if you stop walking, you get shot. And I think that the philosophical musings between the walkers were truly the highlight because they discussed so many things and then brought them back around at different parts of the book and every single time there was some new insight that I loved. Also the way that Garrity's, our main character's um, perspective started devolving towards the end. I, I was really, that really hit me hard. That being said, the beginning was amazing, the ending left me speechless, the middle Kind of got boring to hear about pain, described a million different ways. The Dead Zone. Despite the premise that our main character, Johnny Smith, was in a coma for four and a half years and then comes out of it and is suddenly a seer, being very interesting, uh, the book itself ends up as boring as the main character's name. Sorry to any Johnny Smiths watching. Um, yeah. Yeah, this really wasn't for me. The start was really good. Um, I loved the first chapter with uh, Johnny and Sarah uh, who were ice skating. I just, I thought that chapter was so transform, trans, transportative and beautiful. And even after that initial accident, the part where Johnny's family is like visiting him and they're worried about him, I thought that was really brilliant. Everything else, I hate it, hate it. I actually DNF'd this book with like 50 pages left because I just genuinely couldn't put myself through the useless side plots about serial killers and illiterate kids. So I couldn't do it. Firestarter. This book is kind of like Carrie. If Carrie was much younger, uh, was a pyromaniac and was being chased by this organization called The Shop. and was called Charlie. Um, so Charlie and her dad, Andy, have one of the best father-daughter relationships that I've ever read. And Stephen King, he's like the only author who I can tolerate writing children because when he writes children, he writes them so well. And Charlie was so precious. Um, and yeah, I thought that the villain of the story, uh, The Shop, was very interesting, um, especially when it's later personified kind of in John Rainbird. I thought he was terrifying. Um, and there's this entire question of would the stuff hap have happened um, if, if the shop just would have relaxed and not chased Charlie so much, you know? Um, that being said, there's a segment in the, sent in the middle that's so long and got drown drawn out so much. If you're noticing a theme, I find that a lot of Stephen King books just tend to be very drawn out in places that they don't need to be. Which, you know, Stephen King doesn't plot famously, so maybe that's a reason why, but I think I definitely do prefer it when the author does kind of have a rough outline of where things are supposed to go. Roadwork. To be honest, I don't know how much I can really say about this book because it is just about a guy whose house is supposed to be torn down, and so it's just about him trying to work against that. And this is another one that I had to DNF after like, but this one I DNF'd after 22% because I just hated it. There's sometimes this thing where the writing feels like it's suffocating me and I just physically can't read on and I actively despise opening up the book. And that happened here. So uh, I didn't finish the book. Um, maybe it gets better, maybe it doesn't, um, but really not for me. The one thing that does give it points is the fact that I like how uh, our main character's perspective slowly becomes more and more villainous. So 
that was interesting, but it really wasn't enough to make me keep reading. And after the dead zone, I was not going to put myself through another one. Cujo. Personally, for this one, my thoughts can really be summed up by too much cheating and not enough rabid dog. False advertising, perhaps? I don't know. Um, apparently, King wrote this while on a bender for three days and he doesn't remember writing it. So, I mean, maybe like I'm empathetic to his uh, past struggles, but I didn't like this one. The characters really annoyed the heck out of me. Vic was fine at the start, but then got annoying. But Donna and Tad just, Jesus Christ, I wanted to like, you know what I mean? Um, and yeah, I thought that this was going to be about a rabid dog and I liked Cujo's perspective the most. Why didn't we have more of the rabid dog? Ah, so I once again DNF'd out 50% because I knew that if I kept going, I'd just get <laughs> angrier and angrier. And yeah, the good thing, the only thing that came out of this that I do did enjoy though, uh, is now that I'm reading Pet Cemetery, Cujo was mentioned and I got the reference. I understood that reference. The Running Man. After the past couple of books that I read by Stephen King, I truly thought that he was going to be an author that doesn't work for me. But The Running Man is so good. <laughs> it is about this guy called uh, Ben Richards. And Ben has a daughter called Kathy who has pneumonia. And so, in, but he doesn't have enough money to like get her treatment and stuff. So he signs up for this TV show called The Running Man, where people are chasing him for a month. And if he runs away from them, then he gets the money. Man, the world building in this book just really took me aback because there's this idea that the climate pollution got so bad that it caused this disparity between the wealthy and the poor of the wealthy being able to afford these uh, really advanced uh, filtration masks, whereas the poor can't afford that. And so that ties into that intrinsic problem that Ben has of my daughter has pneumonia. And oh, man, this book was so good. One minute is not enough to discuss some of these books. The Gunslinger. Let me preface this by saying that I despise Westerns, but on the other hand, the man in black fled across the desert and the gunslinger followed, and what more can I say? So for me, the highest I've ever rated a Western is two and a half out of five stars, so that is what I did rate this book. So <laughs> I did enjoy it more than like any other Western that I've read, um, so that is definitely saying something. Um, Roland adored Roland and I adored the way that it was written um, like structurally where you have like this main story but then every so often we have this embedded narrative which turns out to be a short story and I thought that was very clever again I'm not a fan of westerns so uh, that really just the vibe really bogged it down for me but I can't wait to continue with the series especially since it's not uncommon that people don't love book one I will like it on a reread though, I think. Misery. What can I say about this book that I haven't already said? <sighs> it was so good. I had such a massive slump um, with Stephen King and Misery single-handedly brought it, brought me out of it. It is so good. Paul Sheldon's perspective is one of the most stressful things that I've ever read in my life. Um, oh, Annie Wilkins is gave me nightmares. She gave me nightmares, even more so than Salem's Law, and I have a huge ass window right over there. So, you know, I really think that every single person should read this book. I read it in two days because I couldn't focus on anything. It consumed my mind, um, and I have an entire video dedicated to it, so you should check that out if you want more of my opinions. Um, very hard to talk about it without spoiling anything, but yeah, such a great book. Oh my god, that was so stressful. And I definitely didn't say everything that I wanted to say. I think you now understand why there are so many jump cuts in all my videos. And it's because I, um, 
I can't string together a sentence properly, <laughs> especially under pressure. I really hope I didn't offend any of your favorites, though I do know that I have a couple of unpopular opinions in there. If you have any questions and want me to elaborate, do let me know in the comments because I really feel like I didn't have enough time to say everything that I wanted to. But yeah, that's everything from me. Be on the lookout for that video where I talk about four more Stephen King books. Don't know when it's coming, but definitely within the next month, hopefully. Okay, that's all from me and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.